I think Kirby has got the premier program in the country right now. Some people would say Ohio State. I would argue just look at the pellets on the wall. I think Georgia is it, Georgia is right now what Alabama used to be five, six, seven years ago consistently. I think Georgia's that program right now. Hello and welcome in. It's always college football. I'm your host, Greg McElroy, and we appreciate you coming to us as always from wherever it is you're coming to us from. Whether that's on the podcast platform, but that's Spotify, Apple Podcast, wherever you get your podcast, we appreciate you being here. Like, rate, subscribe, and share with your friends. Tell your friends about the conversations that we are having here together on Always College Football. You also, if you're here with us on the ESPN College Football YouTube channel, hit that thumbs up button right below the video, and then leave us a comment in there. If you have a question, we'll put it in our mailbag at some point here in the future. We have a great conversation today with Booger McFarland. Booger does a great job on ESPN covering not just college football, but the NFL as well. He's in studios every single Saturday, wrapping the ABC games, the trio of games alongside Kevin Nagandi. And this year's gonna be a little different. SEC games are going to litter the ABC schedule starting with SEC teams in each of the first three windows on ABC this weekend. You have Clemson and Georgia in the noon window. You have Miami and Florida in the 3.30 window. And then you finish in the nightcap with Notre Dame at Texas A&M. So it should be very, very exciting. And we'll talk with Booger about the ramifications that some of those outcomes may have in the event in which one of those teams loses. We'll talk about SC and LSU. We'll talk about Miami, how things could be perceived for them. We'll talk about Clemson. And are they still going to be viewed through a positive lens, even if they don't beat the Georgia Bulldogs? And we'll talk about Florida State briefly, just briefly, with what they put on tape last week against Georgia Tech. So let's not put off any more of your time. Let's talk with ESPN analyst and two-time Super Bowl champion, Booger McFarland. We welcome him in. He is an ESPN football analyst, does not exclusively do college football. He also does some NFL on Sundays. He's Booger McFarland, voice of Monday Night Football, and one of my favorite people in the entire industry. Boog, what's going on, my friend? How are we doing this week? I'm good, G-Mac. You know, summer's winding down. It's time to talk a little football. Uh, that's a good thing on, on two accords. One, because it starts to get a little cooler. And two, because this is our favorite time of year, man, because everybody's been leading up to football season and it's finally here. Well, I think that you're the perfect guy to have on for, for this week to kind of set the table for some of the narratives that could come out of some week one results. And then there, look, let's just be real, man. Florida State, if you kind of read the paper based on their performance last week, they might as well just stop playing ball shut down the program. I mean, goodness gracious, alive. The reaction is always ridiculously strong. It just feels like it's elevated now because of the expectation level that the Florida State fans had. So I guess we'll start there before we move forward to this week. Uh, what do you think people are going to say about Florida State moving forward in the event in which they play Boston College close after losing to Georgia Tech last weekend? Well, I think people looked at Mike Norvell as kind of if he if he's not the portal king, and if we're going to say Lane Kiffin is, he was kind of right behind him, where he could just kind of plug and play and reload. And I think you know there was always a little skepticism with DJ Uwe Anglele coming in, but now after that performance in Week One, I think we got to go back to the drawing board on two accords. Number one, DJ, you didn't look that good, and two. Mike Norvell looked like he was kind of afraid to let him go a little bit. I um, mean, they were kind of they were very conservative. We know they could run the football, but when it comes to throwing the football down the field, they didn't want to let him do that either because of him or because of the young wide receivers. And so I think that's that's the first narrative. The second one was everyone talked about this much Valley Hood Florida State defensive line uh, led by Peyton. They were going to be able to plug and play. And all of a sudden, Georgia Tech hit him in the mouth and drove him off the football. And so I think if you were looking at the strength of the Florida State team being your offensive defensive line, I think you really got to go back and, and reevaluate where they are. And I think Coach Norvell will. The good thing about it, G-Mac, is this is a new system. And so our, our mindset is, oh, you lost, your season is over. Well, quite frankly, it's not. If you're Florida State, you regroup, 
you go on and you put up 10 wins in the ACC, uh, you're still going to have a really, really good shot at getting into the 12-team playoff. You might even end up with the first round bye. I mean, unless you think exactly, Georgia yeah. Tech's going to just run the table. <laughs> hey, and hey, they're going to carve your way out of the ACC title. I think they're still very much in the mix. And I think I look at their personnel. I still think the got dudes. Now, I'm not going to sit there and just write the narrative that this thing's over. It's done. And by the way, I agree with you completely. I do not think it was all on DJ. Anyone that thinks it was, I don't think was watching the same game I was. So I digress. Let's fast forward to this week's game because week zero feels like a month ago. But let's start in the noon window. Um, I look at Clemson, and I feel like their program's at a bit of a crossroads, right? It's like new era, old era, pre-portal, post-portal, pre-NIL, post-NIL. And you can think about all the glowing, I guess, descriptions you can give Debo Sweeney's program prior to the landscape changing. And now, look, they've really emphasized high school recruiting. They are still hesitant to dive into the portal game, and they're going up against a team that has mastered the current format of the sport. In the event in which Clemson loses this game convincingly, what will the reaction be? Well, I, I think it's going to be more about Georgia than it is about Clemson, to be honest with you, because I think if, if Georgia comes out and Georgia dominates this game, I think we're all going to say, okay, Georgia is who we thought they were, which was the best team in the country led by Carson Bett. We know that Kirby just plugs and plays and reloads down there in Athens. I think the narrative could flip. If you're Clemson, I don't think you're really I don't think you really have anything to lose in this game. Yeah. Because people are looking at you saying, Okay, are you on the level of Georgia right now? Most people would say no. And if you're a Dabo, I think you gotta go in and, and you gotta play this underdog card really hard. You gotta tell your guys, hey guys, nobody's giving us a chance in this game. Nobody respects us. They say we can't do it. I got news for you. We're who Georgia is now. We used to be that team. We were the, the, the bullies on the block that stepped up and locked in, locked horns with Alabama and went toe-to-toe -to -toe and beat them. I think if you're a dabble, that's the role that you got to play and almost go into this game saying, we got nothing to lose. And I think they're going to play that way. Their defense will give them an opportunity to stay in this game. It's going to be up to the offense. And, oh, by the way, that's an offense that really hasn't shown – much like the last couple of years consistently. Where is the offensive continuity going to be? Can they get the quarterback to play at a high level? Can they get some fluidity and consistency with this offense? Because you know what Georgia's going to be. Georgia's going to be physical. They're going to dial up some shot plays with Carson Beck, and the defense is going to be nasty. Like, we know what Georgia is. We really don't know what Clemson is going to be on the offensive side of the football. Yeah, for, for Georgia, it – Look, I don't think anyone, even if they were to lose this game, people are not going to lose their mind. They're going to say, hey, look, they had a bad outing or whatever they can point to as a, a turnover or two. Maybe they had them. And Clemson is one of the best turnover-forcing teams in America. So you can probably point to why they might have lost the game. But if for whatever reason Georgia loses this one and they've lost two of their last three against Power 5 teams and their one win is against the Florida State team that shut it down, how, I mean, how should we be assessing Kirby – now moving forward, when taking into account that that team doesn't look quite the same as it did in 21 and 22 when they won the national championship. I think Kirby's earned the benefit of the doubt. I, I, don't, I don't think we assess Kirby any less than we do right now. I, I think Kirby has got the premier program in the country right now. Some people would say Ohio State. I would argue just look at the pellets on the wall. I think Georgia is, it, Georgia is right now what Alabama used to be five, six, seven years ago consistently. I think Georgia's their program right now. Now, they haven't been there long, but I think if you look at the last th two, three, four years, I mean, Georgia may have been the best team in America last year. If not for losing to Alabama and having one loss and how all that played out, I think Kirby behind closed doors is telling those guys the same thing. But he's earned the benefit of the doubt, GMAC. But something we've mentioned so far, we've talked about two games and two teams, and it's, it, it's the thing that really bothers me the most about this new 12-team playoff. The first thing we said about Florida State is, eh, everything is still in front of them. If Georgia loses, eh, everything is kind of still in front of them. <laughs> I think everybody is so happy with this new 12-team playoff, we are forgetting what made college football college football, which is every weekend and every game counts. And I get it. There's more inclusion now because you get more teams involved at the end of the season. But you tell me if I'm right or wrong. Do you miss the fact that every game counted – and now you and I are doing a podcast, and in the first 10 minutes, we've said twice, mm -hmm. if you lose, not that really, you know, not that big of a deal. 
Well, I think you're hundred percent right in saying all those things. And then I look at what Florida state fans are dealing with right now in the court of public opinion. Uh, I look at what's being said about them online. I look at what's being said about them and written about them in articles su suggesting that the end is near and <laughs> you know they bit off more than they can chew and all these other things. So I think in the immediate, immediate aftermath, the reaction is going to still be extremely strong in defeat. Yeah. But I think it's nice to know that, okay, yeah, we stink, but we still have a chance. That's kind of how I think Florida State fans are looking at last week. It shouldn't feel that way because I don't think they stink, but I think that's how they feel. And I think for all the teams that were to lose this week in a game in which they've challenged themselves, they can be applied to them as well. Now, if you're Ohio State and lose to Akron, I can't help you. Like, <laughs> okay. But if you lose yeah. one against a quality competition, I, I don't think anyone's going to beat you up for it. But you're right. I mean, it is different from what we've experienced in the past. And that's been one of my biggest fears in expansion. But you can't deny the potential fallout that could exist in the event in which Florida lost this weekend and or Miami lost this weekend. I look at that game at 2.30 Central Time and I think whoever wins it is in great shape. Whoever loses it, the vitriol and reaction from the fan base will be harsh and strong. How do you assess the potential outcome of that game? Well, uh, I think if you look at Miami, you know, Miami has openly talked about how much money that their roster has cost. Mario Cristobal has said, uh, you know, we have our quarterback. We know what we're going to do with Cam Ward. We feel really good about this roster. And Miami is is saying, hey, we're back. Quietly, there's a quiet confidence coming out of Coral Gables. And I think everyone kind of wants to see what this roster is going to look like. Can they be physical up front the way Mario Cristobal wants to do on the offensive line? What about this defense? Are they going to play up to their capability? And so I think we know a little bit more about Miami, or at least we think we do, than we do about Florida. And I think everyone right now is just waiting to light the match to Billy Napier's seat because we all know it's warm, but it could be on fire because of the schedule, because of this game being at home, because of all the things we've said about the Florida Gators and, and how they played last year. And Quadis has kept G-Mac. I, I, you go back and you look at the tape, the offense, although the play calling was inconsistent, Graham Mertz wasn't that bad. The issue was the defense. And so when you look at this defense for the Gators – like, think about what we're saying. A Florida team that has athletes in this state struggle defensively. And so now you get Miami at home, in the swamp, at your place, at, what is it, a, a 3.30 kickoff. So everybody, like, everything is set up for Billy Napier to come out and quiet all the naysayers. Can they get it done? I'm, I, I doubt it. I don't think they can because I think from a personnel standpoint, they're going to be outmatched by Miami, but it just shows you where Miami is now as a program and just how we perceive the Florida Gators. And it's going to be a long season, I think, for the Gators. And I think Billy's a good coach, but I think if you look at where Billy is and the expectations that Billy came in with, juxtaposed to what he's done, I think that's ultimately what has the Gator faithful probably disbelieving in him right now. Yeah, and it's fair. But on the other side, uh, you look at where Florida has maybe struggled on defense. You yep. look at Miami loaded roster. Every question they had on last year's roster feels like it's now been improved by way of the yeah. portal and a few more additions in the past recruiting class. So if they go on the road and can't beat this version of Florida, what is that? What is the narrative going to be on Miami? If you're Miami, you can't get this done. Then I, I think everybody's go back, got to go back to the drawing board. It's almost like we gave Mario a pass after what was it, the Georgia tech game last year when he basically cost his team a game. And so now you go out this offseason and you have a great portal recruiting the whole nine. You get all the money. We all know about that. And it's almost like the faithful down there are saying, OK, we'll give you a pass on that one as long as you can come out and prove this season that you, you and your team are ready to go. And I, and I think if they can't get it done right now, I think Mario seriously has to go back and just wonder. But I can't wait to watch the quarterback play because I think it came down to, if I'm not mistaken, Florida State and Miami for the quarterback. And so he went to Miami. And so now you got this quarterback who we saw him play out West last year. Now he brings his talent to the ACC. So what is he going to look like with this talent, with this coach? How high, how, how much success can he have? Because I, I honestly think in the right situation, 
he could be a Heisman Trophy, not just a Heisman Trophy candidate. He could be invited to New York, Greg. That's how much I think when you look at Cam and you look at this offense and you look at the numbers he could put up in the ACC and the spotlight that's going to be on him, we could be looking at one of the three or four finalists for the Heisman Trophy, especially if he gets off to a, a good start in this in this 3.30 window on ABC on Saturday. Yeah, big opportunity for him. And I mean, I think he's the real deal. I think he's awesome. So I, yeah. I'd be shocked if he played poorly on Saturday. And if he does, that's a testament to what Florida's done on defense to grow yeah. – on that side of the ball, moving to your alma mater. Uh, remind me, you went to Florida. You, no, yeah, LSU. You went to LSU. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I thought for a second you were Seminole, but I've, I no, nope, that's right, LSU. I don't know how. Oh, I see. Uh, after after last year, you were on the Seminole bandwagon. No, I, I'm just kidding. In all seriousness, I, tried to, I, I just stood up for what was right, and you and her, <laughs> I'm just you, you, with you, you, you and you and Hurt Street were on the wrong side. Oh, I was that's on the right fair side. enough. Fair enough. That's that is a million years ago. So yeah. we'll we can have that conversation at a later day. I'll read that in your book at some point uh, about how you stood up for what was right. Yeah, it's exactly exactly. What Looking at at LSU though, look, I I think Brian Kelly's done a heck of a job. I feel like LSU fans feel that way too, but there's still last year's disappointment on defense. While it was great to have Jaden Daniels and it was an exciting brand of football. I don't feel like LSU fully appreciates what Brian Kelly has already done in two years, winning 10 games in back-to-back -back seasons and doing some great things along the way. So I are there are they just are they just still cautiously optimistic? Like where is LSU right now as regard you know, in regards to Brian Kelly and their relationship with him? Well, I, I think what you look at is when, when, when BK got there, he was exactly what LSU needed, which was they needed a CEO to follow Ed Ogeron, who was, by all accounts, a loose cannon, I mean, toward the end there. And so you, you come in, you bring in BK, button up, structure, everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. He brought the program back to where you expect it to be. Now, you win 10 games your first two years, and everybody's happy, 10 games, bowl game, yada, yada, yada. But you know and I know – that with the dudes that LSU should be getting in Louisiana, and if you look at the history of the coaches in Baton Rouge, the last three coaches have all won national championships. The last three, all right? Saban, Miles, Ogeron have all won national titles, and they did it a certain way. They did it by getting the Louisiana kids to stay home. They pick and choose where they get the kids nationally, and they play a certain brand of football. Well, BK is doing it a little bit differently. OK, he's doing he's doing things just a little bit differently. And I think that the faithful are cautiously optimistic that his way is going to work. Now, with the 10 wins, it's cool. But you need that you need to be able to play a certain brand of football. You need to be able to not just beat Alabama um, on a two point conversion. But how do you how do you go on the road and, 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 and play against Ole Miss? How do you play against Georgia? Uh, in the SEC championship game, because some of the bigger games that BK has had, BK has struggled a little bit. Now, he's beat a lot of people that he's supposed to beat. There's no question. He's beat a lot of those people. But the bigger games, I think, is what everybody is used to seeing, because LSU's mantra is just like Alabama. Anywhere, anybody, anytime. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. USC in Vegas, no problem. We'll see you there. And so I think everyone wants to see LSU, more importantly, BK's team get back to the mantra that the past three coaches have built anywhere, anytime, any place. And he's got a great opportunity this Saturday or this Sunday night to do that. Is this though, I, I think LSU is still going to be in pretty good shape regardless of the outcome on Sunday. BK's built up a lot of goodwill. I still think at LSU, even though it's like, okay, it's been a little different. I still think he's got a long runway of positivity with having won a Heisman and won an SEC West title already in his first two years. On the other side of the coin, I and mean, we have colleagues, uh, we don't have to tell you who they are. You can probably guess um, that are classifying Lincoln Riley's tenure at SC as a complete disappointment. Uh, I personally would push back on that. He was a win away from getting to the college football playoff in year one, won a Heisman Trophy with a team that really didn't have that much talent on either side of the ball outside of Caleb Williams and a couple of receivers. You look, though, as things kind of look ahead here for Lincoln Riley. You got LSU week one. You got Michigan on the schedule. You got Penn State on the schedule. Like You got Notre Dame on the schedule. Is this game against LSU kind of a must-win situation to kind of change the narrative on what's being said about SC? 
There's no question. And, and, and I think if, if regardless of who's favored, I think the pressure in this game is, 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 is double that on Lincoln Riley because of perception and reality. Reality is these two teams are in a very similar situation. Both lose, lose Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks and both have defenses that stunk last year. And they brought in new coordinators and they're trying to revamp the defensive side of the football. They both think they can score a ton of points. So which defense is going to be the most improved to get the key stops in this game? Like that's the reality of the game. That's, that's the reality. Perception is Lincoln Riley, I think, Greg, has been a failure because of the expectations. So I think sometimes we have to look at what was expected and what we get, what we got or what we're getting and ask ourselves, are they living up to the bill? And so you made a point about one game from the playoff, Heisman Trophy winner. But I would argue that relative to the expectation when they gave him 110 million, paid off his house, private jets and brought him to California, they are expecting because it's USC. They are expecting national championships, just like LSU is expecting every three, four, five years to be a national champion. And so I think the perception of Lincoln is he needs to start to win these big games. And sometimes it's not necessarily about just winning. How you do it? Because we know USC can, can score 50 points, but can they stop anybody? Okay, can that, can that defense, that revamped defense, can they be physical? Because the perception of Lincoln Riley is he just wants to call plays. He just wants to be an offensive genius. He doesn't want to stop anybody. He doesn't want to be physical. He just wants to run GT counter, play and, and RPO. That's like, that's all he wants to do. And so I, I would push back on you and ask you this. Relative to what was expected when he left Lincoln, do you think he's lived up to what they were getting when they gave him everything he got and now that he's in USC? I just don't think he inherited a very easy situation. I mean, he walked into a place that was awful and their talent had dried up. Uh, I don't feel like they were able to retain talent. He was able to infuse some talent onto the initial roster by going and getting Jordan Addison, Caleb Williams, yeah. you know, a couple of high profile guys at skill positions, but the, it was made up really of shoestrings and bottle caps. They won, but it was because of spectacular play at the skill position in that quarterback. It wasn't made out of substance. And while yeah. I know people have pointed to his tenure at Oklahoma, he had teams at Oklahoma that did have substance. He had great offensive line personnel early in his tenure. I think he had a team that was really physical in 2017 that ran into a buzzsaw against Georgia in the Rose Bowl. Granted, that was early in his tenure, but I still believe that Lincoln Riley knows how to win. But there are questions that I have about how they practice and how they approach physicality in practice. And if that doesn't adjust, I think it's going to be hard for them to be really tough and it's really hard to be built from the inside out, which I think is how you put together championship rosters. Uh, I would agree with you, Greg. One, one question since you're a quarterback. Garrett Nussmeyer, Miller Moss, neither one really has a ton of experience. So based on what you've seen with these two, give me a little scouting report on both of them. I think Garrett Nussmeyer has more natural ability. He's got a big arm. I think Garrett Nussmeyer has um, a little bit of a I don't care mentality. I'm going to throw it anyway, which can be fun to watch, but also really <laughs> dangerous. I think, he, yeah. I think he walks a fine line, and I think there's a possibility – that he could come out and have a Patrick Mahomes type play, or he could throw it backwards over his head and it could, you know, get returned to the house. I mean, he's, I think he's really high ceiling, but there might be some catastrophics built in. You just got to know that that comes with the territory. So I think as far as natural ability, though, he's, he's big time. And I, I think he's got a chance to have a huge year this year with his supporting cast. Miller Moss. A little bit uh, in to be determined mode. I love the way he fits into the system. I think he's got quick hands on the RPO game. I love his supporting yeah. cast. They got four really good sophomore wide receivers at SC. So I think as, as long as he's accurate and decisive, he's going to be successful because this offense is so quarterback friendly. So I think if I had to pick one to be an NFL starter, I'd take Nussmeyer. But if I had to pick one to operate within the scheme, I might take Miller Moss. But gotcha. TBD, it's just too short of a sample size on both to have a good feeling about where they're heading. Let's talk quickly, though, about what's going on with James Franklin. It's a game that's a little bit overshadowed 
Um, yeah. I just don't think a lot of people have high expectations for West Virginia, even though I think they probably should be higher than they are. Mm -hmm. I think they're a fringe top 25 team with what they bring back on offense. But I'm not so worried about West Virginia. I'm more worried about the optics for James Franklin in the event in which he goes to Morgantown and loses because everyone has said now, hey, the shifting landscape in the Big Ten, no one will benefit more than James Franklin and Penn State. Well, hey, week one, new frontier, and you lose on the road to a team that does not have crazy high expectations according to the public. So how big is week one for James Franklin and go out and get a victory? Well, I think it's huge, especially with the comments that we heard that James Franklin made this offseason saying, you know, most people would be happy with 10, 11 wins a year, uh, except if you're at my place. They're not happy with that. And the reason being, James, is because with those 10, 11 wins, you haven't beat the two teams that you need to beat. That's Michigan, Ohio State. Like, at some point, like, we got to understand what the job description is, a la Ryan Day. Hey, Ryan Day, you can win. I, I think Ryan Day's lost seven games in his career. But he's what, 0 3 against Michigan or something like that? I forget the stat. Like, he's only lost like six or seven games in his, his entire career, but he's yet to beat Michigan. And so certain games matter. And I think I would say the same for Penn State. If you're James Franklin and, 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 and you are the school in that state, Pennsylvania State University, with the way that they've recruited, with how they want to play, with the talent that they've had that's went, went on, that's gone on to the NFL, um, yeah, you, you should be able to compete with Michigan and Ohio State consistently. And I think the narrative will shift, especially from a few years ago when James Franklin was flirting. Uh, it was the offseason where BK got hired, Lincoln Riley got hired. Yeah. His name was floated out there a lot. And I think Penn State re-upped this deal. And they were like, okay, so you're going to moonlight with some of these other programs in order to get your money up. I get it. That's how the game is played. But we expect wins here. We expect Big Ten championships here. We expect to be in the college, playoff, uh, college football playoff. I think James Franklin is in the same boat with uh, Lane Kiffin, James Franklin, I think Dabo, and there's probably a couple of guys I'm missing that getting into the playoff is the minimum, okay? Like it's the minimum based on where, where they are in building their program. Like as much as Lane Kiffin has talked, like if Lane doesn't get this team into the playoff, it's a failure. If James Franklin doesn't get this team into the playoff, it's a failure. I think you can, if Florida State, even though Florida State lost, I think there are certain teams that if they don't make a 12-team playoff, you're going to look at this team in this season as a disappointment. And I think Penn State leads that group of teams where playoff is a minimum for them to get in, especially I think Michigan is going to have a down year. Uh, you could say the top two teams in the in the Big Ten are going to be Ohio State and Oregon. Okay, I need to I need to see it play out. Penn yeah. State should be right there, McElroy. Uh, I'm, I don't disagree with you at all. I think it's there's no reason, there's no excuse. You got to create some explosives offensively, and you got to be better on that side of the ball. Defense should be great. Was last year, yeah. has been for a while. Offense now needs to pick it up, and hopefully, you no know, OC Andy Kotelnicki he can help him do that. Finally. Uh, a and M, we're on the same page here, right? Like they lose to Notre Dame. It's not the end of the world. It's game one of a new era in College Station under Mike Elko. Like sky is not falling in the event in which they lose, right? I completely agree with you. Sky's not falling. I think Notre Dame comes in with with, with the better team. I think uh, as, as long as Riley Leonard can stay upright, uh, I think Notre Dame has the better team. But here's the issue, and it's something I'm sure that that you know from what I've been told. The weather in South Bend all fall has been, you know, 72 degrees. It's nice. They've had a couple of days where it's been hot, but for the most part, it's been 72 degrees. They're going to go to College Station, and those big those big old boys, it's going to be 95 at kickoff, McElroy, and that game's going to be outside. There is no mandatory water break like in high school. You're going to have to line up and play. And so I just wonder how Notre Dame is going to acclimate. It's a real thing how they are going to get this team to acclimate in College Station if Mike Elko and this a &M team can play physical football and keep that defense on the field and, and, and get, the, get this team to play almost like the SEC teams play every week. Drag them into the deep end of the pool and see if they can survive early September in Texas, in the heat. But, but, but make no mistake about it. Notre Dame has the better football team. Yeah. However... I'm going to say be very, very careful in College Station Saturday night. Uh, I don't disagree. The, the, what about Notre Dame, though? They lose this one. 
And I, I don't like to get too far down the, you know, we're looking at a situation, their own one. There's not a lot of meat left on the bone. One of their big games that they needed to really prop up their resume was Florida State at their place. Florida State just lost. SC plays LSU in Sunday's game. That's their second biggest game remaining. They're an underdog in that game. Potentially, Notre Dame's three biggest teams that they play might all start the season 0 and 1. AM, yeah. USC, and Florida State. So Notre Dame, I did they have to be 10 and 2, 11 and 1 at the very least to make their way into the playoff, just given how things might end up for them fasting forward to the end. Well, I, I think if you're Notre Dame, there's no because there's no opportunity for them to host a playoff game as far as excuse me, get a bye, because they can't be one of the top four seeds. Right. So even if they were to go twelve and zero, at best they're gonna be fifth. All right. So I think if you're Notre Dame, you gotta look at this season like this. If we're 10 and 2, 11 and 1, we're getting into the playoff. It just matters, are we gonna be able to host the game on the first weekend or do we have to go on the road? And so I think they have a little wiggle room. Perception may change, but I think Notre Dame, even though the schedule is not the hardest, the schedule is not Florida. It's not Florida's schedule. We know that. So if, if, if you're Marcus Freeman, you just want your team to be playing their best at the end of the season. They don't have a conference championship game. They're not going to have to play that weekend. You kind of get the automatic buy as far as you don't have to play on conference championship weekend. And so if you're them, 10-2 and two gets you in. May not be the fifth seed. They'll probably wind up being somewhere between, I don't know, seven and ten. But all you want is an opportunity because we're going to first, for the first time, we're going to get what the NFL gets. It re it's really not going to matter what seed you are. It's going to be about the matchup. All you want to do is get in. And if you get in and you have a favorable matchup, I think that's the team that's going to advance. I think we're going to see a point where you and I are going to sit at the desk on those Tuesday nights and we're going to talk about seeding and what happens and all these different <laughs> things. And ultimately, it's going to come down to matchups. Whereas last year, we argued about, well, who's, who's in the top four? First four, uh, uh, first two out, all that good stuff. This year, it's going to just be about who would you rather be? Would you rather be the fifth seed or would you rather be the, the ninth seed? Like, those are going to be some of the more fun conversations we have come late October, November, when you and I sit on the desk. We'll be there, man. Look forward to it. Great stuff today. Appreciate the visit. Great perspective. Helping us kind of transition to the end of this week. We're almost having next week's conversations today, which is, yeah. is kind of fun. So I appreciate your time, Bug. You're the best, buddy. Who you got this week, man? Clemson, Georgia. Tune in. I noon Eastern, ABC. Are you going to be in the be studio there. at halftime, or will you just let Kevin take that one solo? No, I'll be in the studio starting at noon, so make sure you're on your P's and Q's. Yeah, it's funny that you say noon. I, I'll say you'll be there around 1 o'clock. Yeah, about one fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Continue to encourage all of you to like, rate, and subscribe to the show wherever you get to show. You also can subscribe to the ESPN College Football YouTube channel. We've seen that number triple, quadruple, go up by leaps and bounds since we started on this platform. So we appreciate the support that you are showing that channel as well. Don't forget, tomorrow is the best show of the week that we, well, we think it's the best show of the week. You might feel differently. You might like the conversations that we'll have on Wednesdays. You might like the top 10 that we put out on Mondays. You might even like the Sunday reaction show that we put out every Sunday. But my favorite show of the week is the Thursday show where we preview the biggest matchups of the weekend. And we do a deep dive. In some cases, six, seven, eight minute breakdowns. Every possible angle that you think might determine the outcome in some of the biggest games of the week, we will hit it and we will discuss it. Keys to the game, big players to watch in the game, aspects of the team's development that might make a little bit of a difference and might give them a slight edge. So we dive deeper than anybody and you will be prepared as anybody if you listen to tomorrow's show. So for all of us here at Always College Football, we appreciate you as always. For Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have an amazing day and remember it's always college football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.